time is a platform for the United Nations to follow up on implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development contained in the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Its goal is to establish peace and prosperity for the people and the planet now and in the future. Its mantra is leave no one behind. One of the thematic review areas this year is advancing human well-being and ending poverty, which aligns most closely with ECPAT USA's advocacy goal number four, ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education. And goal 16, promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all level, especially target 16.2, end abuse, exploitation, trafficking, and all forms of violence and against and torture of children. At PET USA, we'd like to thank our co-sponsors, the NGO Committee to Stop Trafficking in Persons, Childhood Education International, and the NGO Committee on UNICEF. Two notes. First, this panel is being recorded and will be available to res registrants after the presentation. Second, we would like to advise our audience that some of this conversation will involve sexually explicit information and may be difficult or triggering for some participants. We also advise that children under the age of 18 not view this panel presentation. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our speakers for this morning's discussion. Manas Dabara is a child protection officer at the Office of the Special Representative of the UN Secretary General on Violence Against Children. Prior to taking on this role, Manus was the head of policy and legislation at the Office of the Ombudsman for Children in Ireland. He also previously worked in the Human Rights Unit of the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs. Dr. Gail Dines is a professor emerita of sociology and president of Culture Reframed, the first nonprofit to adopt a public health approach to the harms of pornography. Culture Reframed parents programs are designed to help build resilience and resistance in young people to pornography and hypersexualized media. Dr. Dines' latest book, Pornland, How Porn Has Hijacked Our Sexuality, has been translated into five languages. John Carr is one of the world's leading authorities on children and young people's use of the internet and associated new technologies. He currently sits as the senior visiting fellow at London School of Economics and Political Science. John also serves as technical advisor to ECPAT International and as secretary for the British Children's Charities Coalition for Internet Safety. Shanifa Bennett went from sex trafficking victim to survivor to advocate for other young women caught in trafficking's web. She has been recognized by the Office of New York Governor Andrew Cuomo for her extraordinary efforts to help other survivors escape this modern form of slavery. ECPAT USA is honored to benefit from her insights as a member of our Survivors Council. Kyra Wooden leads the Youth Against Child Trafficking Program educating middle and high school youth about the risks of child sexual exploitation, encouraging young people to become activists on the subject. Thank you all for participating today. Manus, we're going to begin with you. Um, the international community adopted the Sustainable Development Goals five years ago. The SDGs promised to end all forms of violence against children by 2030. Can you get us started by explaining the connective tissue between the Sustainable Development Goals and child exploitation? And how does the UN conceptualize the issue of internet safety? Thank you very much indeed, Laurie. Uh, and I'd like to thank ECPAT USA very much uh, for the invitation to take part in this important discussion. Uh, I'll be very happy to speak uh, to the issue of the Sustainable Development Goals and, and also the connections uh, with the International Child Rights Framework. Um, uh, but I guess one of the first things to say is we're having this conversation in the shadow of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which has, has created some, some new realities for us to deal with as it relates to 
violence against children online. Uh, we know that with some of the confinement measures, uh, children who are out of school are online more and more. Uh, we know also that we have some younger children who previously were not so connected also being online. And while the internet affords um, great opportunities for, for continuing with education, for maintaining connections, uh, we also know that it brings with it attendant risks that we have to confront. Um, that includes, of course, issues related to child sexual abuse material being available online, uh, ex exposure to inappropriate content, uh, but also a whole host of other issues, other forms of violence online, uh, including, for example, cyberbullying, hate speech, and so forth. Um, in responding to this, uh, one of the things that, that the United Nations has done um, is come together to produce an agenda for action, uh, to look at the different kinds of violence that children are being faced with uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. That includes trafficking. It also includes uh, violence against children online and provided some important pointers for member states and the international community on what needs to be addressed. Um, and that includes, for example, making sure sure that schools and educational institutions uh, enhance their safeguarding practice, um, also empowering children, building their skills uh, to, to manage risks and know where to go if something bad happens. Of course, supporting parents and caregivers uh, is another important dimension, as is looking for stronger action from industry. But this agenda for action was very much based uh, within the sustainable development framework and also the international child rights framework. And there, there are two frameworks I want to, to speak to in some, in some detail. First of all, because they provide important guidance uh, to countries around the world on what needs to be done to tackle violence against children, but also because they represent important commitments, promises that have been made by states uh, to, to prevent and respond to all forms of violence against children, including exploitation online. Um, you've already mentioned some of the important sustainable development goals, just to say a few words about that. Uh, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development with its 17 goals was agreed in 2015. And it is, it is a universal vision uh, related and relevant to all regions of the world, to all countries, on how to advance uh, human development. And there are a number of targets, as you mentioned, that are relevant to, to violence against children. You mentioned target 16.2, uh, but also many other targets are, are connected with this global effort to end violence against children online. Uh, we have targets related to education. We have targets related to gender equality and empowerment of women and girls. We also have SDGs that are looking at how expanding connectivity to the internet can advance human development. But all of these are connected we cannot hope to achieve, for example, uh, the SDG on education, on guaranteeing inclusive quality education, if violence continues to blight the lives of children all over the world, including online. And likewise, if you, you, um, if, you, know, if you, if you continue to allow that, that violence to continue, uh, there's, there's no prospect of, of other targets being realized as well. So it's very important to see this framework as being connected. All the SDG targets and goals are connected. Uh, and, and we must have this sort of broader vision uh, if we want to succeed. Um, turning now to, to the child rights framework, which is very closely connected, and certainly the framework that the UN would approach um, questions relating to the exploitation and abuse of children online. Um, and the main, the main uh, reference for us there is the Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, which is the world's most widely ratified human rights treaty. And what that means is more countries have signed up have promised to realize the rights set out in the Convention on the Rights of the Child than any other human rights treaty. And one of the things that, that states have promised to do uh, is to end all forms of violence and exploitation of children. Um, and there's been a lot of um, detail worked out over the years on what that means concretely uh, in practice and, and done in particular by the group that monitors the implementation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. And when they look at the issue of violence, um, they take a very broad view uh, that we're not just dealing with symptoms. Uh, we have to look at the, the whole spectrum. We have to look at prevention. Uh, we have to look at the laws that prohibit all forms of violence against children. We have to look at the services that are there to support 
um, victims and survivors. We have to look at access to justice and we have to look at making sure that we end impunity, that offenders are brought to account. But in addition to that, we have to also remember the connections between ending violence and other rights that are um, guaranteed by the Convention on the Rights of the Child, including the right to education, the right to health, but also children's right to access information and freedom of expression, and making sure we find the right balance uh, that, that guarantees their safety online, but also um, respects those other rights as well. So what I might do just to drill in, in some more detail is just speak about um, some of the important principles coming out of the SDG framework and also the child rights framework uh, as it relates to violence against children online and, and how that is supposed to frame the response and the action by states. Just starting with one of the most important, which is around child participation and empowerment. Uh, that the vision of the Convention on the Rights of the Child uh, and indeed uh, the, the SDG framework is seeing children and young people very much as agents of change, uh, and that they should be empowered to take an active role in their own, prevent, in their own uh, protection, uh, and that their views should, should shape our responses, uh, should shape our laws, our policies, our programs that are designed to tackle um, online violence. And, and in doing so, we have to remember this is all children, including especially children in more vulnerable circumstances who find it more difficult uh, to have their views known and, and to, to share their experiences. Uh, moving on to another important dimension of this, which is education and awareness raising. Um, that, and, and here again, we see the need to actively include children and young people in designing the materials that are there um, to indeed make them more aware of some of the risks and to enhance their skills in, in, in dealing with the online world. And here we have important um, issues to bear in mind, like communicating with different age groups, communicating with children from different backgrounds, bearing in mind different cultures, the gender dimension, and so on. That we need also to make sure that the channels we are using to reach out to children and young people resonate with them. Uh, adults typically aren't great at devising those. Again, we need the input, um, the lived experience also of, of survivors in an ethical way, of course, uh, to make sure that the, the tools that we are devising are really fit for purpose. Um, and in talking about digital literacy, uh, I think it's important to remember that's not just about the technical skills of dealing with the online world. That also means the issues around uh, some of the ethics of that, awareness of how children and young people are interacting with others online uh, to make sure that really this is a, a sort of very complete sort of awareness raising uh, exercise. And of course, it's important to, to raise awareness uh, and to upskill, if you like, uh, parents and caregivers. Um, and here I just want to mention that the International Telecommunications Union, a specialized agency of the UN, recently led a process to update a series of child online protection guidelines. So very recently published, uh, and I would commend them uh, to participants here. It includes child online protection guidelines for children and young people, uh, materials devised with the input of young people and for three distinct age groups. When you're talking to, for example, children under the age of nine, it's very different from talking to 16 and 17 year olds. So these are tools that have been devised with those different age groups in mind. I would also say that, that the International Telecommunications Union, ITU guidelines uh, have, separate guidelines have been developed also for parents and educators, uh, focusing on that target audience, uh, which again, I would, I would commend to participants and also to say that ITU has done a great job in pulling together uh, materials from around the world um, as a sort of a hub of resources um, so that, that people can also, if they want, explore further. Uh, but just to say that, uh, you know, when it comes to looking for guidance, um, it, parents and caregivers are not on their own. Uh, there is material out there. Indeed, sometimes one wonders if there's, you know, perhaps too much to, to, to try to find um, uh, what is best uh, best suited to keeping uh, keeping children safe, but there is suffice to say there's a lot out there uh, for people to benefit from. Uh, another important aspect of building a proper rights-based response uh, to to these issues uh, is making sure there are places to go when something goes wrong. So ensuring that children and young people have access 
uh, to mechanisms like helplines, like hotlines that are again devised in a way that is child sensitive uh, and, and really going to have their best interests at heart. Another important dimension of that, of course, is making sure that the services that are on offer for people who suffer rights violations of this sort um, are again fit for purpose, that they are coordinated, that they are informed by, by best practice and evidence, that they are not stigmatizing uh, of people who experience uh, these forms of violence online, uh, and that we make sure that there are, are, there's proper follow-up um, and, and connections between, between those service providers. Um, another important dimension raised by the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child is around the particular responsibility of tech companies, the industry that, that is um, really at the heart of, of a lot of these services and platforms. Um, some of them are doing quite a lot, others are not doing so much. So I think it's, it's important also for us as a community working on this issue to continue to push for higher standards in what uh, tech companies are doing to, for example, ensure prompt removal uh, of inappropriate and illegal material, child sexual abuse material, for example, to ensure safety by design uh, in their systems. But also remembering that when it comes to the tech industry, states have an important responsibility uh, to ensure that they are, are high standards, uh, to ensure that whatever model of regulation they settle on, that we are achieving the desired result, which is the protection of children online. Um, and indeed, the, the ITU um, Child Online Protection project also has guidelines for industry as well, which have been recently updated. Um, and the final point I want to raise at this point is how, how to make all of this happen. Um, and, and here just to emphasize some of the really important functions that states have, um, commitments that they have voluntarily taken on by becoming um, parties, as we say, to the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, and, and also an, an additional treaty uh, on the sale and sexual exploitation of children, which again, many member states have signed up to. Um, and one of the most important functions that states have is to ensure that we have at, at the national level proper coordination, that we have all the people that are needed around the table, um, that we have national authorities, that we have civil society who plays such a crucial role, both in advocacy, providing services uh, to, to children. Uh, industry, of course, is really important, regulatory bodies. So, so bringing all of these people together is crucial if we are to adopt this more holistic approach um, to the problem. Also ensuring that action that is taken is properly resourced. We know that that's a huge issue, uh, not least, for example, in relation to law enforcement agencies who are trying to deal with what is often a rapidly evolving uh, moving target uh, in this area. Um, ensuring also that we have strong laws that deal with prohibition, that deal with support for victims, access for justice, and also ensuring that, um, that this national level response is underpinned by, by the most recent data, by robust evidence, uh, to make sure that we really are doing the best by children and young people. Um, and I think that, you know, this is, there are many more things I could say about the framework, uh, Laurie, but just to give a sense perhaps of some of the, the key dimensions of what a rights-based response demands. And um, I think it's fair to say that there is a lot of distance that we still need to travel. And um, if we want to reach that target of ending all forms of violence against children by 2030, including uh, the sexual exploitation of children online and offline indeed. Um, there's in all of those areas still a lot of ground to cover. Uh, but the encourage, and on an encouraging note, um, there is a very large and vibrant community working on this. ECPAT obviously being one of the more, uh, more important examples uh, within the UN system, within academia, um, within many walks of life, and children and young people themselves, particularly those with lived experience who have, have come forward uh, to share their experience uh, and also to, to guide us uh, in relation to what needs to be done. Uh, so while there is still distance to travel, uh, if we are to achieve the goal by 2030, there are also uh, signs of hope and reasons to be optimistic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manus, for setting the framework for this conversation. Um, you mentioned that uh, there are organizations that are uh, leading the way to protect children. And um, 
Dr. Dine, certainly Culture Reframed is one of those organizations that, that is pioneering really important ways to have conversations about this issue. Um, can you tell our audience a little bit about the dangers that the porn industry manifests online for youth and how Culture Reframed envisions solutions to the pervasiveness of the porn industry and of over-sexualized imagery? I certainly can, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak today and um, welcome everybody. So what I'm going to do is sort of do a very quick run through of what could be obviously a days and days of presentation. My particular focus is looking <coughs> at the uh, impact of pornography on youth and what happens to the um, social, emotional, cognitive and sexual development of kids, especially boys who are the ones who tend to find porn more than girls. So I want to begin, not moving, here we go. So I want to begin to say that when I'm talking about pornography, I'm not talking about Playboy. Playboy is gone, finished, so if anyone's thinking of that, think of something else. And the problem is that we have a parent naivete gap, which means that in studies we find half as many parents thought their 14 to 18 year olds had seen porn as had in fact watched it. So 50% are not aware of what's going on. And a lot of them are underestimating what their kids are seeing by a factor of 10. So this is a really big problem because we have a public health crisis, but it's a stealth public health crisis because very few people seem to really get what's going on. And this doesn't just include parents. I've lectured before pediatricians, educators, and I always get the same response, which is one of shock. And actually, I don't want to see shock. I would rather that they understood what kids are growing up. Now, one group that does clearly understand what's happening to kids is the media. And this is Details, which is kind of cosmopolitan for men. And they had an article called How Internet Porn is Changing Teen Sex. And they said there is an entire generation of young people who think sex ends with a money shot to the face. If people don't know that, a money shot is ejaculation on the face. So the media knows what's going on because they're tied into the porn industry, which I'm going to explain a little bit later. So first of all, to get into what am I talking about, about mainstream pornography. Again, I'm not talking about Playboy. The main acts that you get to free within five to 10 seconds include gagging a woman with a penis to the point that she's choking, sometimes she's vomiting, very, very rough anal sex, pounding anal sex, ejaculation on face, ATM, which stands for ass to mouth, where the uh, man puts his penis into her anus and then into her mouth without washing as a way to debase her, hair pulling, spitting in her face. So the average um, image on Pornhub, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute, or most of the porn sites, is one woman being multiply penetrated in body pounding, body punishing sex, being called every name imaginable, being spat upon and then ejaculated on by all men. We know from studies, and this is the gold standard study, that 90% of the most watched scenes have some form of violence against women in them. So with this thing, we want you to think about what it means for boys' sexual template to be developed around this. We know that the average age of boys first viewing pornography is actually around 9 to 11, depending on what study you're looking at. Now, when I was writing my book, Pornland, and was immersed in pornography, I kept thinking, you know, how do these kids stand it? Because, I mean, I could barely stand it. I was sort of watching the porn like this. And then I started to ask myself and look at, really, what are they, what are they, how are they, how is the porn industry dr dragging them in? So I started to look at the text. So I want to give you an example from something called Gag Me and Then Fuck Me. And it says here, do you know what we say to things like romance and foreplay? We say, fuck off. We take gorgeous young bitches and do what every man would really like to do. Look how clever this is. We take gorgeous young bitches and do what every man would really like to do. This is not true. Every man does not want to do this. But what they're doing is they're kind of putting a carrot out to say, do you want to be a real man? Then this is your rite of passage to be able to tolerate this level of hardcore pornography. Another example from a promotional copy from Anally Ripped Whores, we at Pure Filth know exactly what you want. 
chicks being asked for till their sphincters are pink, puffy and totally blown out. Adult diapers just might be in store for these whores when their work is done. Again, very clever. We at Pure Filth know exactly what you want. No, they don't. The 11 year old is not looking for this. He thinks maybe he'll be lucky if he comes across a pair of breasts or maybe a couple having sex. He is not expecting to be catapulted into a world of sexual violence. So I would argue that this is causing trauma in young boys. And what we know from unresolved trauma is that the more trauma you have, the more you go back to the site of the traumatic experience in the hope that the ending will be different. So you're actually building in trauma as a part of the business model to create habituation and addiction, addiction in very young boys. So how did we get here? How did we get to a point where it is free to go onto any porn site where you are seeing violence against women, body punishing sex, the debasement of women as a sex class? You have to understand the porn industry as an industry. And the key part is that the internet made porn in 2000, when it became accessible, it made it more affordable, accessible, and anonymous. The three major drivers of demand to pornography. So this is a key thing that happened. Porn sites get more visitors each month than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined. We are not talking about a small industry. We are talking about a multi-billion dollar industry. Also, very important, the court, and this is from Adult Video News, which is the porn, website, um, porn news site. The corporatization of porn isn't something that will happen. It's already happened. And when you're talking about the corporatization of porn, there's one company that basically is the Amazon of porn, MindGeek, which controls 10 of the most popular free porn sites in the world. So Amazon is, I'm sorry, MindGeek is the key to understanding the business model. They bought the free tube sites in around 2006 and seven, and the key one is Pornhub. This is what they own, which is their big cash cow. Pornhub statistics, 42 billion visits a year, daily average of 100 million visitors, 90, 962 searches per second, uploaded 4.79 million new videos last year. Just think, if you lived to be 150, you'd never get through them, and created over 1 million hours of new content. That's just in one year. Now, Pornhub traffic during the pandemic. What's very interesting is we saw an increase from 120 vis million visitors a day to 134. A lot of these are boys. Now, why? They say on Pornhub that the reason is more men are home all day, which is men and boys, and also very important, Pornhub made its premium content free. So now the premium content that used to be behind the firewall, as well as the free porn is free. When the premium became free, in Italy, visits increased 57%, in France, 38%, in Spain, 61%, and in the US, 40%. The average time of peak viewing is 3 a.m. Now, what we really need to understand here is the cost platforming of pornography marketing to kids. And through the cell phone has made it much easier because whereas parents could somewhat monitor the computer in the middle of the room or whatever, once the kids get the cell phone, all bets are off. And even if you put every filter on a cell phone that exists, it doesn't mean that that kid's best friend is gonna have that. So I just want to give you some of the main statistics on the uh, major platforms for kids. So we see 76% of teens are on Instagram, 75% on Snapchat. I actually think this is changing because Snapchat is becoming more popular. Kids are going down on Facebook. The reason they're not on Facebook so more is because we are the older generation, their parents, their teachers. Now, how the kids get porn on Instagram, Snapchat, and other places is through emojis. A lot of the porn is hidden behind emojis. For example, the eggplant stands for penises. This stands for breasts or buttocks. This stands for oral sex. Imagine what this stands for. So while you might think your kid has got cute emojis on their Instagram account, they've actually got porn hidden behind them. And anything with teardrops is ejaculate. That stands in for ejaculate. So let me give you an example how it works. So on um, Instagram, Sonny Leone has 11.7 .7 million followers, one of the most popular porn performers in the world. You go from her, you click on, you, you can swipe, and what you get is straight to Pornhub. 
But Snapchat is even worse because Snapchat has Snapchat Premium, which is where the porn is hidden. And you have companies now setting up from soup to nuts, hardcore porn sites for, um, in Snapchat Premium for porn performers. So Instagram, Snapchat and other gay apps are gateways to the porn industry by normalizing porn for teens. And it makes perfect sense that in fact, what would happen is that the um, pornography would actually, without question, cannibalize the internet. I'm not gonna go through the research. Anyone who argues that porn does not undermine the social, cognitive, sexual behavior and, and attitudes of kids and development, does not know the research. The jury is back in. We have 40 years of research, all with the same narrative of the harms that porn has on kids. These include limited capacity for intimacy, more likely to use coercive tactics such as sexting, rape, involved in risky behavior, increased anxiety, depression, habitual addictive use, and now the recent research is it's increasing erectile dysfunction in younger boys and men. They have boys in the crosshairs of their rifle. Why? Because of the brain development. We know that around 11 or 12 as the brain is developing, what happens is that the prefrontal cortex is not fully online and boys and girls, but especially boys are looking more for novelty and risk taking and porn certainly speaks to the developmental level of the brain at that age. The porn industry knows this, they're out for our boys. Now, the future looks even more bleak because what's happening is there's so much content and so much violence that there is a level of desensitization. So now what we have is increasingly boys and men who are desensitized with porn are looking at the category of teen porn on Pornhub. So you have images like this where she looks very young. This is all legal. First, my first time with daddy, daddy's hall. Don't worry, she's my stepdaughter. Teen porn is basically the dominant one. And I want to give you an example. These are the categories on Pornhub. There's 85 of them. And if you look at the numbers, amateur looks the top one, 304,000, and then big tits, teens, and then teens at 262. Actually, that conceals what's really going on. When you go into Pornhub and look at the tags, which means what the men who are looking for teen porn are also looking for, also put in like small tits, solo female, virgin pussy, etc. When you add them all up, the teen category is actually over half a million videos. It is the largest single category on Pornhub, which means that he's putting our teens at risk because we now have men masturbating to images of women or girls that look very young. So how do we change this toxic culture? We as adults have had an incredible abdication of responsibility by allowing the porn industry free, ac free access to our kids. If I worked for Philip Morris, I could not stand outside a middle school and hand out free cigarettes. I couldn't knock on doors and say, do you have a kid here? If you do, give them this packet of cigarettes. And by the way, I'll be back tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Why is the porn industry the only unregulated, above ground, multi-billion dollar industry? Our solution is that we come at this every which way. John is next, he's going to talk about age verification. At Culture Reframed, we take the public health approach. What we do is we bring together a group of experts from all fields who normally don't speak to each other, educators, mental health, medical professionals, parent groups, activists, youth and family advocates, and we have built programs for parents because public health research says the key protective factors to bringing up healthy kids is parental support or quality healthcare. So we've honed in on parents. We are the only organization in the world, nonprofit, to have built a full online robust parents program because parents don't know what to do. <clears throat> they don't know what to say. They don't know who to speak to. They can call a friend, but you know what? She's going to be no use because she doesn't know what to do and nor should she. Why should we put this on parents? So we have developed a one-stop shop for parents, a complete best practice kit, a 12 <coughs> module online program for parents of tweens. And we've just gone live with our 12 module online program for parents of teens. For our parents of tweens, these are just some of the modules we have. We introduce them to what's going on with their kids, the notion of boundaries, development, the hypersexualization of their lives, how to bring up pornography, 
how to have conversations. And the most key part here is we have scripted out in both programs, 12 conversations that you can have with your kids. You, your kid, you, your kid. And a lot of parents are taking these, downloading them, and they're using them as a template to how to have these extremely important conversations, not conversation, with their kid. So you've got a full practice. So if you want to go there, I suggest you go to Culture Reframed. We did our Parents of Teens program because if you don't talk to your kids about porn, the porn industry will. So go to Culture Reframed Parents program. It is free. Both programs are free. We made a political decision to make them free so that everyone would have access to them. We are a nonprofit, so that was a big cost on our part to give away our product. Each program took two years to develop with the leading experts in the field. And if I've not covered the whole issue within, what, 13 minutes, please feel free to, inter to contact me, Gail Dines, at info at Culture Reframed. So our email is info at Culture Reframed. And I just want to make a plea that it's about time that we as adults adulted up, did the right thing, and stopped the porn industry from hijacking our kids. We love our kids. We put energy into our kids. We do not want to hand them over to a bunch of predators living in LA. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gail, for that um, very informative, but uh, extremely uh, provocative and, and disturbing conversation. I have to say this is not, I, I have heard you give this presentation before and every time it is just shocking. So um, I really wanna thank you for uh, being so clear about the dangers that are, are facing our children. Um, John, we've we've heard now from from Gail and from Manus uh, that issues are exacerbated um, in the current moment. But you've you've actually examined the data on youth internet usage during this intensified period of online activity. What can you tell us about the scale of the threat, and how do we maintain focus on child exploitation? as attention swings from public health crises and economic instability to issues of racism. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, can I just pick up <clears throat> briefly from a couple of the things that Manus referred to? The ITU guidelines, which I think are only two weeks old now, or maybe three weeks. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm one of the authors of the, of the set of guidelines that are directed specifically at children. And Man has pointed out <clears throat> that we split it up into three different age categories because uh, having conversations with four and five year olds is not the same as having a conversation with a 15 or 16 year old. <clears throat> and in developing those guidelines, I might say, we were able to engage with groups of children uh, in three different countries on three different continents who helped, as it were, frame the messaging. So I hope uh, you will go and look at those documents uh, and I hope you'll find them useful because that's what they're meant to be. They're meant to be used by teachers and parents. Um, <clears throat> the second point, again, the UNCRC, uh, essentially a pre-internet document. It was adopted in 1989, which was, I think, exactly the same year that the World Wide Web was uh, developed or invented <clears throat> and it was the invention of the world wide web which in essence uh, led the internet to becoming the mass consumer phenomenon that we are now all familiar with well at the moment um, i'm not quite sure when the process concludes but it's not too far off they are producing a general comment on the uncrc there's no possibility of amending the convention at least not in two or three lifetimes time, uh, but they have produced a general comment which updates important aspects and reinterprets uh, the, the important aspects of the convention in the light of the way in which the, um, the, the internet has developed and what we now know about children's use of it. But to go back to uh, the, 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 main, the main heading and what's been happening to children, uh, of late, specifically in the context of lockdown and COVID, uh, caused by COVID, <clears throat> and what, what does the data tell us? Just one general uh, point to make as a preliminary to that. What we've got at the moment is a perfect storm. 
Um, but the weather conditions, the reasons underpinning this perfect storm, the weather conditions which created it have been a long time developing. They've been a long time uh, coming, down, uh, <clears throat> coming down the track. And even if when we come out of, uh, even if we come out of co co lockdown anytime soon, and I'm, I don't know how likely that is in some countries, but even if we come out of, of lockdown anytime soon, from the point of view of children, the condi those conditions are not going to be changed. What will happen is it will just seem that things have got better because many of the problems that children are experiencing now during lo lockdown will be less compressed and they'll, they'll simply be taking place uh, over longer time frames. But in essence, nothing will have changed. We used to say, in fact, still do say, there's only one thing worse than children having access to the internet, and that's children not having access uh, to the internet. We're very close to the point, uh, I think, where uh, internet access for a child will be considered to be a basic right for all children. And that's because so much of modern education and school administration has shifted to, uh, to, to the online environment. A great deal of young people's social and cultural life has shifted online. If you haven't got internet access, that makes you the weird kid or it makes you the poor kid. It shouldn't be like that, but that is the reality of young people's lives. So one of the great issues of concern in, in Britain, and UNESCO has commented on this as well, and I'll, I'll come to UNESCO's stats in a minute, um, <clears throat> is, has been the element of educational inequality, educational disadvantage that children uh, have been experiencing as a result of lockdown. One third, uh, and this is a British statistic, one third of Britain's poorest children do not have adequate access or any access uh, to the internet at home. Amongst the richest uh, families, uh, that percentage drops to around 1%. So children in poor, from poorer backgrounds, from poorer families during lockdown have been suffering uh, educational disadvantage in a way that is not matched uh, in, the, in the households of, of richer, better off families. In total, it was estimated that 700,000 school children in England, that's not the whole of the United Kingdom, just in England, were unable to complete homework assignments because they had either zero or inadequate internet access in terms of bandwidth, or they lacked the devices that would give them uh, such access. Five million adults actually have never used the internet. Five million British adults have never used the internet at all or have not used it in the past three months. So this is uh, not just a problem for young people, but it's particularly acute um, in the lives of young people. So turning to some of the, some of the data that's been collected around the world. Save the Children did a survey uh, of 6,000 parents and children from the USA, Finland, Germany, Spain, and the UK. And they recorded uh, how uh, many children were struggling with feelings of isolation, boredom, and this is a quote um, <clears throat> uh, from, from the UNESCO survey. Children, young people who are outside regularly have a lower, acti lower activity in the part of the brain that focuses on repetitive negative emotions. And this is one of the reasons why children can slide into negative feelings or even have depression during circumstances uh, such as COVID that they're living in now. Oxford University, um, did another survey, I think that may have been just of British children, this was just of four to ten year olds, and there they recorded also uh, similar psychological issues and problems arising amongst children as young as that. Turning to slightly more familiar issues for, for our community, in the first month of lockdown, the British hotline, so that's the IWF in the United States, it's called NICMEC, uh, recorded 9 million, 8.8 .8 million to be precise, attempts to reach child sex abuse material, what, what's often referred to as child pornography in, in America. The, the police in, in London, uh, the number of arrests that they made of paedophiles, of people who were, uh, or rather people suspected of being involved in child sex abuse, increased by 45, uh, 45%. Europol and Interpol, have been, have been uh, reporting regularly from police forces around the world that they too 
are picking up and reporting and noting uh, significant increases in the activity of paedophiles, child sex offenders um, in the online space. Calls to our national abuse line, uh, domestic abuse helpline, went up by 50% um, in the first three weeks of lockdown and have, have been sustained at a, at a high level ever since. 32% uh, increase in calls to our national children's helpline about from children uh, who believe they are being abused in some way or another. In the first two weeks of June, stop it now, we have a British one, there is a, a much bigger one in the United, Sta uh, the United States, reported a 71% increase in calls to their helpline compared with the same period of last year. And 388 of these callers were concerned about their own sexual thoughts and behavior towards children. And 214 of those callers, by the way, were brand new, uh, were brand new callers. There was a report that was published yesterday uh, suggesting that one in five vulnerable people uh, have been considering self-harm during lockdown, such is the nature of the depression uh, that they've been, uh, or psychological problems and harms that they've been suffering um, as a result of, uh, of lockdown. And UNESCO, I mentioned UNESCO earlier, they recorded that there have been school closures in 143 countries around the world involving 1.184 billion uh, children, that's 70% of all pupils and students attending schools. So this is not something that's just a problem in Britain and the United States or Europe. It is, it, it is a, a global uh, problem. Gail mentioned earlier about the significant increase in traffic to pornography uh, websites. This is a subject that we've been very, very concerned with in the United Kingdom. Our parliament passed a law requiring age verification to be introduced by pornography sites irrespective of where they were based. So they didn't have to be British, but there are very, very few British pornography sites, some, but not many. Most of them are in Canada, Russia, um, uh, the USA, places like that. But irrespective of the jurisdiction in which the publisher was, was in, under British law, they will soon be required to have age verification. It hasn't been implemented yet. The law is there, the law's been passed. It hasn't been implemented yet, but we think this is, going to be an incredibly important way of protecting children um, uh, around the world inside and outside of lockdown because it's the as Gail was saying the evidence of the harm that's done to children through their exposure to pornography is now um, is now crystal clear um, <clears throat> some of the reasons why the the lockdown has presented particularly acute problems are, are fairly obvious if both parents are working from home, then they're going to have to do their jobs. They're gonna to have to, if they want to keep on earning a living, that's assuming they're fortunate enough to have a job where they can work from home and still, uh, and still uh, 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 earn, earn a salary or earn a wage. And what that inevitably means is, is, is two things. First of all, there'll be bandwidth issues. So they'll, they'll want the devices and they'll want the bandwidth so they can do their work, which means they have even less time to supervise or support their children. And if their children are locked in with them, then of course the internet is gonna be, or is gonna be one of the key places that they're gonna be uh, spending much, much more time with. So going back to my earlier uh, point, uh, what, COVID, what the COVID crisis has done and what lockdown has done is put a spotlight on a number of faults and underlying issues that all of the conventions and all of the guidelines and all of the stuff that Manus was talking about and others have spoken about over the years have simply not yet been able to address adequately. And how does this all tie in with the SDGs um, and their very, very ambitious um, objectives? Well, we don't yet know what the new normal is going to be, uh, assuming we ever do get back to a, a time that we could call normal. There could be second or third waves of COVID, uh, which bring back strong lockdowns uh, in many, many parts of the world. And, and, if, and that could be much, much worse than what we've already seen. But what COVID has done is highlighted just how far governments still have to go to ensure elementary aspects of children's rights are in place. The right to an education, the right to be safe, the right to be free from violence of abuse and abuse. COVID does not let governments off the hook. On the contrary, 
it underlines the importance of them getting on and addressing uh, the underlying causes. And what I think we're beginning to see around the world is people saying enough already of voluntary measures that industry simply ignores, enough already of appealing to these businesses to do the right thing. We have to get into a, a much uh, clearer regulatory framework and for what I've been reading about what's been going on in Washington, D.C., even the American Congress now seems to be coming around to the point of view that leaving the Internet industry and leaving the way in which we manage the Internet uh, to the players who've been responsible for it up to now is simply un unsatisfactory. I will send the, 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 the sources and uh, websites that I've been uh, getting this data from to, to Laurie after this event. So if anybody wants to get, get at some of the statistics that I've just mentioned or see the sources that then come from, uh, they, they'll be able to do that. Thank you very much. John, thank you so much for sharing that very important data. I think it really illuminates the policy discussions that um, really need to be had around the globe. Uh, Shanifa, I, I would like to take this information, this, these, the really important research that's been done, the important global initiatives, and the data that we've heard, um, and bring it down very much to the personal level and i'm hoping that you can walk us through your own personal experience and share with us the type of grooming tactics used by traffickers um, and also what can those of us in the session do to prevent other youth from being similarly exploited online Thank you so much, Lori. Um, just wanna thank you for having me a part of this conversation. Um, so I'm gonna be covering just the grooming tactics. Mm, just to the audience, this is not all of them. This is just the main ones that I've either experienced or I have had um, discussions with other young women as well, and they've experienced these as well. Um, Lori, do you wanna bring up, do you wanna, do you want me to read it from here or are you going to have the audience just see the sheet? Um, I think that our producer can screen share. Can we, okay. have, can we have the image shared? Let me see if we can have it shared. Thank well, do you, you want to start discussing it and I'll ask to have it, I'll have yeah. it while you're talking about oh. it. Um, the first one that I have these little, so I have these little just quotes um, that I've either heard um, my trafficker tell me, and um, also they are just little, just little ways that you can kind of pick up on the language as well. Uh, when you hear it, a trafficker or someone that's not supposed to be doing what they're supposed to be doing, say these kind of things. So the first one is, I can see you. And that is identifying um, vulnerabilities. That is something that they're very, very good at. Traffickers do pay attention to um, young women and young boys and what they're going through, how they may look. Um, just even noticing that they're not close to their parents or they're kind of suffering from depression or just little body images that um, a person is going through. The second one is you can trust me. That is gaining their trust. Um, once a trafficker knows what the person's vulnerability is, they will try to fill that need to gain their trust, such as things as buying gifts, loving them, and making them feel wanted, protecting them, giving them basic necessities um, that you that they feel the um, victim can't get any elsewhere, um, even such as bribing them as well. Um, the third one is it's just me and you, and that is. Um, isolation. So once the trafficker has the person's trust, they will isolate them, um, telling them you don't need to be around your family. It's just me and you. Um, usually they know where they go, what they do. Um, and also there are no boundaries. So most of the time, in most cases, the victim will tell the trafficker a lot about their 
issues, a lot about who they go with, where they go with. So the trafficker doesn't necessarily need to dig up this information because once they gain your trust, it's like having just a regular conversation with anyone. Um, and the fourth one is I own you. That is maintaining control. So oftentimes traffickers kind of keep a person by just setting quotas, um, forcing them to do drug and alcohol abuse, not letting them keep personal possessions. Everything is owned by the trafficker, clothes, jewelry, necessities, um, even hitting them or hurting them, phys physically abuse, um, if that comes down to it. Um, when necessary, the trafficker will stabilize a person's emotion by using empathy, um, letting them know, like, I understand what you've been going through, but being here with me is going to make it much easier. Um, this is to kind of keep the person believing that they need the trafficker to help them be emotionally regulated. So those are kind of like my four just little points of how grooming can take place. Once again, this is not all of them. Um, these are just a few to kind of keep an eye out for, um, especially now that COVID is out there and it's once again, kind of just taking over the internet. These things you will most likely see. Um, I personally was lured through the internet through a dating site at the time. Um, and he used a lot of these kind of tactics. That's it for me. All right, Shanifa. Well, thank you so much. And we will make that, that grooming tip sheet available to our audience. We'll distribute it at the end of the presentation. But I, I really appreciate you coming forward and sharing this because it's, it's important to talk about the data, but it's really also important, as Manu said early on, to learn from survivors and have survivors inform us in terms of of best practices. So um, Kyra, in terms of talking about best practices and learning from survivors, could we talk a little bit about ECPAT USA's work to educate youth and improve their literacy on issues of trafficking and exploitation? And what are some of the common misconceptions that you combat? Um, hi everyone. Yeah, thank you so much, Lori, for introducing me. So I do want to talk about our Youth Against Child Trafficking program. Um, and we created this program specifically in light of what a lot of people have been talking about, that young people are often excluded from this conversation. And so ECPAT understands that young people, you know, um, have these world experiences. They are on the internet. And as Gail was saying, they're viewing violent and inappropriate content. Um, they have the ability for abstract thinking skills skills and they have the ability to express themselves. And so we want to provide a place where we can discuss these things and alleviate these misconceptions and also protect and how they can protect themselves in an environment where we can give them the correct information and they can feel affirmed about these questions that they may be having about sort of their relationships and trafficking. So just how does the WIAC program work? So unlike other subjects, sexual exploitation requires a lot of sensitivity to the issue. Um, and um, as we, and a lot of sensitivity, empathy, and respect. And so we have created these facilitated workshops to guide these conversations. And so we go into schools with middle age and high school age, middle school and high school age youth in New York City to learn about sexual exploitations in their communities, what it is, what it looks like, how they can protect themselves, and also how they can stand up for both themselves and their peers. And so we created the skills based, interactive, holistic, and trauma-informed curricula. And so there are three series of workshops in this curricula, and I want to go through a little bit of what we're teaching our young people and also sort of common misconceptions and common ideas that young people have in each of these areas. 
So our first workshop is child sex trafficking. And by far the most pervasive myth, sort of what Shanifa was saying about human trafficking, is that um, often lots of people believe that it involves kidnapping or some sort of physical force of a child into a situation. And those, and those, those um, types of trafficking and sexual exploitation methods exist, it is definitely not the most common. And in reality, most traffickers use grooming. It's this method to teach the individual, as Shanifa was saying, to accept the abusive behaviors and, and accept this cycle of abuse. Um, and grooming is also, again, it's slow, it's methodical, it's intentional. And young people, though they have a lot of sort of um, stranger danger, protective behaviors as far as who they should be talking to online or in person, they don't realize that traffickers are often there to gain their trust first um, and to instill this sort of trust and care. And abusers will often request victims, as Shanifa was saying, to request victims to do certain things to test their boundaries. So something that may start off as changing their name or um, changing their names or wearing certain clothing could eventually push the young person into doing sexual acts that they may not be comfortable with. Um, and so, uh, or for example, having a child not be able to leave without their trafficker's permission. So ch child sex trafficking really goes into those misconceptions, what young people, what vulnerable young people are victim to this and what are the warning signs and all of our sessions including this session closes out with concrete ways that young people can raise awareness about this in their schools so this sort of leads into our healthy relationships workshop which is by far one of our more popular and interesting workshops for young people again most traffickers use trust and rewards to control their victims and many survivors of trafficking have often viewed their trafficker as their romantic partner at one point or another during the relationship. And so throughout this process, this victim is usually isolated, which normalizes the behavior, and young people believe they have no other options but to, um, to be subservient to their traffickers. They can confiscate victim's identification. Um, they can make the, tra tra the victim reliant on the trafficker. And the more an abuser, is able to keep the individual in in their keep the individual away from their social networks this it's easier for the abuser to get the young person to do what they want and so we talk about what makes up a healthy and unhealthy relationship both our platonic relationships with our friends and family and also with um, our significant others we talk about the power and control and how that is used in the cycle of abuse and what it actually means to consent to something and finally this um, workshop is really popular because we go through different scenarios that young people may be faced with and what they might be doing, uh, what they believe is correct in these scenarios and ways that we can sort of alleviate and make these relationships healthier. And how we could, if we can't make our relationships healthier, when it might be time to leave and how we can do that. And then finally, our Healthy Relationships Workshop is actually one of the more important ones given this time, as, young, as we have all been say, saying during COVID, young people have more time and access to their technology. And sex trafficking, which was already hard to notice um, on our streets, is now moving to online venues. And traffickers have been using social media to lure in youth and new, new victims. And so we talk about what these luring tactics look like. Um, and the, when we're talking about what these tactics look like, we talk about the protective behaviors that young people could have online that will make sure that they are not as vulnerable to predators. And so we talk about the do's and don'ts of posting online, what is catfishing, and these warning signs of online pred predators. And students have lots of misconceptions about the internet. From our own research, we found that about 30% of our participants before our workshops um, didn't know that it's illegal to send or receive images as a minor. Um, and that really sort of normalizes this behavior of sort of this sexed industry, this idea of sexting and sextortion and pornography and these sexual images. Um, we also found that about 60% of students before our workshops also didn't know that their information once posted online is not theirs anymore and it's not private. So we talk again a lot about privacy and making sure that our, our information is only available to the people that we know. 
Um, to keep engaging young people outside of the classroom, we also have our Instagram for young people and we post a lot of different tips for young people and how they can stay safe online. And for example, not accepting new friend requests from people we don't know or how your photos that you post can be used, saved against you. And this leads into our campaign that we currently have called the, the Reddit Set It campaign. So again, as young people are online, we have created new guides for online safety, not only for our youths, but also for our educators and parents. And I just want to show some of these guides right now, just to give a quick skim through them. Okay. So this is a sample of our parent guide. So we try to explain what it is, what grooming is. We talk about catfishing and we talk about the ways that um, young people, uh, parents can talk to young people about sexual exploitation. And we talk and we specifically give guides for parents to go through the privacy settings of young people's social media accounts. Because again, that's a, a main way that uh, traffickers target young people. And a lot of uh, parents don't actually know how to use, as Gail was saying, how to use the phones or what they're doing. So we give guides on doing that. And then just to look at our next guide, this is a section from our youth guide. Okay, so this is a section from our youth guide. Um, again, during COVID, young people are having more time and access and they don't exactly know what all of these things are and they don't exactly know that their images can be used against them. So it's just short messages that we can give to young people so they can protect themselves online. And finally, just to give a quick look at our educator's guide. Um, our educator's guide is also available to show teachers who have especially more access to students than we do right now, to show them different things and different indicators that they can look out as warning signs of trafficking. So we give um, different indicators for trafficking, how they can victim report, and also helpful resources if they want to talk about this to other educators in their schools. Um, thank you, Lori. I think I am finished. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing that information, Kara. And I, I might add, ECPAT USA has translated um, that information into Spanish, and it's also available now in Chinese um, and Korean with other languages uh, coming forward shortly. We, we really want to make this information um, as simple and user friendly as possible, and also for as wide an audience as possible, particularly um, Gail, as you highlighted, uh, so that parents can understand the technology that their children are using so that uh, we can protect them. So um, I would like to field a few questions that we've received online. We're going, we have some time for our Q&A session and this first question comes from uh, ECPAT USA and Edmund Rice International. How can we do more to support the adoption of new terminology to replace the common term child pornography? So John, you mentioned this term is still used quite frequently in the United States. Um, online to, so examples calling it instead online child sexual exploitation uh, and child sexual abuse material. Um, this rebranding better states the severity and criminality of the images, videos, and actions taking place. And what I'll do is I actually think that this is a question that uh, a number of panelists can answer. John, since you were the, uh, the person who, who mentioned um, the use of child pornography in the United States, I'll start with you. 
Yeah, um, the child protection community in Britain and many countries in Europe, and actually also in the United States, <coughs> Mac -Mac very in their, a lot of their publications refers to child sex abuse material, even though legally in the United States, federal laws refer to fe uh, child pornography. And by the way, um, a great many um, instruments of the European Union refer to child pornography still. So it's, it's a problem, a historic problem. It's not a, a victim-centric way of describing uh, the problem, which is why we've been campaigning to get that language dropped. Uh, I think we just have to keep battering away at it. Um, some people get very, very touchy about uh, challenging their use of language. So it's something that needs to be done with a degree of sensitivity, but persistence, because it isn't the right way of describing <clears throat> what uh, the victims depicted in those images have been involved in. I can also add, uh, as far as when we're talking with young people, oftentimes young people feel sort of out of control of their lives. And so in our workshops, in our child sexual exploitation workshop, we talk about how young people can use language to empower and get rid of the stigmatization of victims and what's going on. And I think that young people really find that that's a concrete way that they can use every day in their life to change the attitudes. And so we do mention why child pornography isn't the term that we should be using and how we should be using sexual abuse material instead. We also talk about how to really frame the issue in a way that's direct. So for example, using the word John um, as a term of our exploiter, we really want to call things what it is and use connotations for young people and say that this is an exploiter, this is a trafficker, this is an abuser. And I think that's a really good way to get to young people to change um, how we interact with these issues. I would also like to add, um, I think it's crucial that we change the term child sexual exploitation images or materials because it, <clears throat> it's basically a crime scene what you're looking at but also um, I'd like to add that I wish we could change the name of mainstream pornography to women's sexual abuse materials because it's not a separate issue you know in the terms of the violence that happens to women on porn sites and we know more and more women performers are speaking out this is also a crime scene where women are being raped tortured um, and so I think it's, I think we have to understand that although there is a distinction, in some cases, the level of violence and also a lot of women in porn over 18 started earlier and nothing magical happened the day they turned 18. They're still exploited. Thank you, Gail. I appreciate that, um, that additional insight. It's really critical. Uh, I do want to add, John, you mentioned that there is um, a movement within the United States to correct some of this language. Um, there is currently federal legislation under the Earn It Act. Um, ECPAT USA is part of a coalition of anti-trafficking organizations, child protection, protection organizations, um, that uh, adds some additional levels of accountability. Um, but one of the pieces that the act does is it corrects some of the federal language throughout to be to change from child pornography to child sexual abuse material. Um, and for people who are interested in the Earn It Act and also contacting members of Congress to support the Earn It Act, um, that information is on the ECPAT USA website. And I, I would encourage people to indicate if you're in the United States to contact your legislator. Um, let me go back to you, Gail, because there was a, a question. Um, where do images of young girls on Pornhub or other sites come from? Well, a multitude of places. Um, parents, um, pimps, johns, um, traffickers. Um, some, a small percentage are produced by the girls themselves as well, but that's a small percentage. Um, and increasingly what you're seeing is that a lot of the younger uh, girls are actually coming from Eastern Europe geographically, because um, it's an easier place to use children, there's less laws, and um, they disappear overnight, the producers. You can't find them. And there's now been a law, Pat, there's now a law been up, up, upheld, overturned, and now upheld again, called 2257, where you have to keep documentation that anyone on a porn set is 18 or over. 
and it has to be uploaded onto the porn site, that documentation, which is just a picture, just a picture of a driver's license, whatever. The porn industry has fought that law for years, 20 years. Um, I was an expert witness for the Department of Justice in the Third Circuit. We won and we upheld the law. And two years ago, it was changed again. And now secondary producers do not have to adhere to 2257. And the secondary producers are actually the distributors, mainly MindGeek. So even if an image of an underage girl is uploaded onto MindGeek, the new law says that they are not responsible on Pornhub or anywhere for taking that down. So this, is, this was a devastating um, ruling by the judge who originally it was the same judge who upheld 2257 two, a few years later, rescinded it. Yeah. Um, thank you, Gail. Um, Shanifa, this question is for you and I see that you answered it online, but I, I think it's such an important question that I'd like you to share it with the broader audience. Is it has to do with once a relationship between an exploiter and a victim has been established online, um, how easy or how difficult is it to end that relationship? And do you have any suggestions as to how that relationship can be ended? Shanif, if you could take yourself off mute. There you go, sorry. Um, when you are dealing with kind of online bonding, Sometimes it could be very, very difficult just due to the fact of number one, if they've already like gained that trust, those group, especially like using the grooming tactics, it can be difficult. So if they've already shared personal information, if they're sharing stories, um, if he's coming off more like a friend, then I would say it would be more so different. Um, key ways to kind of end it is when you start noticing like this person is becoming more i would say verbally abusive if this is happening between like online online if they're starting to ask you to do things that they never asked you to do before um if they start bribing you then you know that that is not a relationship that is going to start either luring you into trafficking or luring you into like another just negative direction can I also add something to that about, it's really a trauma bonding. And the trauma bonding is so difficult to break because of the degree to which the um, victim is trauma bonded to the perpetrator. And I know a lot of women, you know, who are exiting and run exit programs, one of the biggest things they have to do is to kind of pull away the prostituted girl from the actual pimp because um he's by then she's so isolated so groomed that there's so little of her own sense of self left inside of her um that's what and certainly is true with the porn industry as well i mean these are masters of grooming these pimps traffickers and everything else yeah that mental that mental connection is very very hard to break away from um I've been out of the life for three years now. And sometimes like I still have that mindset of, oh, you know what? Maybe I need to go back and be dependent, especially during times of struggle, during times of where I feel like I'm not loved or I'm not wanted. I'm like, oh, maybe I should step back. But um, getting that emotional help and that extra um, support from programs like EGPAT, Dahlia's Hope, GEMS, um, Covenant House, they made sure to, to support me fully in everything that I needed to do or wanted to do. So you're definitely, absol absolutely, you're absolutely right. Um, so bond, that mental kind of gap is very, very hard. Um, so yeah, I said- a great film on that. Yes. I very said young girls. It's mm -hmm. excellent showing of the trauma bond between them. Yeah. yeah. Boys as well. Well then, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Shanifa, for sharing that. And it is, um, so Shanifa is part of the ECPAT USA Survivors Council. And one of the things we learned from our survivors is that you don't just one day you're a victim and the next day you're a survivor. It's a continuum and there it's a struggle. It's, it's not easy. And so um, 
one thing that helps other uh, individuals seeking to exit uh, commercial sexual exploitation is having the group like the Survivors Council of people like you, Shanifa, who can inspire others and say, I did it, you can do it. Um, but it, it takes support. But I, I yeah. just can't, I can't thank you and other members of the Survivors Council enough. It's so critical to hear your voice. Um, so a question that we have is, so the distance between what Manus shared and what Gail shared are two ends of a continuum. Um, how can the UN take a clearer ethical stance against prostitution, which is violence against girls and women, when we have the term sex work legitimizing and legalizing sexual exploitation, there are double standards and this impacts children. Um, and I'm going to say, who, who wants to answer this question first? I'm sure there's a range of responses here. Uh, yeah, Laurie, I'm happy to jump in and uh, I'll, I'll keep this brief as I took more than my, my fair share of time earlier. Apologies to the moderator and fellow panelists. Um, yeah, I, I, I can speak more to the issue of violence against children. Um, and I know other colleagues work very actively on the issue of the sex, sexual exploitation of, of women. Um, so for us, it's very clear. And it's one of the reasons that, you know, terms like child prostitution and child pornography need to be a thing of the past, that this is always a form of violence, always a form of exploitation. Um, and, and indeed, we, in, our, in the mandate I work for, we, we, we promote uh, this updated thinking and terminology so that we are not trivializing uh, violence against children, we are not normalizing violence against children, uh, because language absolutely does matter. Uh, and we have to be absolutely clear uh, in, so for, uh, in relation to, to children in particular, which is the area I work on, that there's no such thing as okay forms uh, of, of exploiting uh, children. It's, it's absolutely clear uh, from our perspective. Thank you. I would like to speak to the term sex work. Um, uh, this, is a, this was a term developed by the industry, by pimps to legitimize um, prostitution and trafficking. It was a way to um, render invisible the violence done to women and girls. And I think there's a lot of well-intentioned people who think that the term sex work is actually providing some sense of um, empowerment to the women and girls in the sex industry. But what you actually do when you use the term is you um, hand over all the power to the Johns, the porn producers, by really legitimizing what they're doing. Because sex, I mean, what is sex work? What, as a writer and activist, I do brain work, and you can compare that to somebody who's being prostituted and, and sold into sexual slavery as sex work. I find that an abhorrent term and a way to completely eradicate the violence that women and children suffer in the sex industry. And I wish we would absolutely take that term on and stop using it. Thank you, Gail. Um, this question is for both uh, for Gail and Kyra. Uh, what are the methods that your organizations are using uh, to measure culture reframes, education, and activism effectiveness? Um, Gail, this is for you, and then Kyra, also for you, uh, in regards to the Y Act program. Okay, so we begin by when we write the program, we start the two programs, we begin with bringing the best experts in. We then have, it, when we've written it, it then goes out for peer review to a second set of experts. We also have, a, we're working with an assessment team who do focus groups with parents who've taken the program to see what their impact is. Also, of course, we measure impact by how many people are actually on our program, downloading it, using it. That's a bit more challenging because, for example, we know that schools download it once, but yet it's being used across the school in um, uh, sexual health classes, human development classes. And in fact, what we found at Culture Reframed is although it's a parent program for parents, it's so robust and scientifically based that it's being used by educators, therapists, um, health experts, pediatricians. So we really do measure it in terms of how much use um, through um, pre post test questionnaires and through focus groups. And we want to say to anyone here that if you're interested 
and adopting this program into your schools or communities or whatever we do give it away it can be downloaded and we say to people you can't add anything in but you can take stuff out if you think it won't work in your community or school because we you know your community better than we do so we do offer it that service as well um, for the Y Act program, I wanted to add that we offer the workshops free of charge for schools as well. Um, and measures that we take if we first, we do pre and post testing for students to uh, gauge knowledge retention for the methods. And we use that data to inform what we need to do for our workshops for the following year. We also um, use the metric of teacher satisfaction. Um, usually most teachers and guidance counselors, whoever have hosted our workshops, often want the workshops again for the following year or for a wider range or group of their students as well. So those are the main things that we do. And also just to give a sort of statistic of the effectiveness of the workshop, we find that about every year, roughly 25, there's about a 25% overall increase in the knowledge that young people get for our workshop. So we can tell that sort of that young people want this data as well, because in addition to their pre and post questionnaires, we also ask students, do they want this data? Do they want to raise awareness? And we usually get about half of the students per workshop who want to know more, which I think really demonstrates this sort of type of need that we need these sort of conversations in our school. Students often leave comments at the end of workshops too, and they all say that we knew about it and now someone could tell us sort of the nitty gritty of trafficking. Um, and I think again, with this sort of idea that sex work is becoming, or this term of sex work is becoming more prevalent, um, branding this, the anti-trafficking movement is becoming harder more than ever. And so we really have to talk to young people about what it means that young people can't consent to this and that this isn't sort of a viable work for young people. Thank you, Kyra. And um, just to add, there were a number of uh, questions about how can they access the ECPAT USA uh, information. And um, Kyra, you generously offered to give your uh, email address. Do you want to share it with the group? Uh, yes, yeah, so my email address, I put it in the chat, but it's kwooden at ecpatusa.org. I'll also drop in the chat right now the link to the parent, educator, and youth safety guides, just in case. Great. Um, okay, I had one question that was just sort of a, all right. So this is a, the small picture question, very like, you know, one sentence answer, I guess, because we're getting close to the end of our presentation. What can I do to fight child sexual, uh, sex abuse and trafficking locally in the US? So um, I guess, I don't know if US people wanna, I mean, Manas, you're, you're working in the US, but you're working globally. So I'll, I'll hold it open to um, anyone who wants to answer. Join an organization that's already doing it in your area and work with them because there's there's more effectiveness in numbers. So I would look around for, there's lots of anti-trafficking organizations in state, different states. And I think it's important to join forces with people who've spent many years in the field and really understand this. So that would be my recommendation. Yeah. Also, um, something I would recommend if you want to do some more work that's not along the lines of prevention and more the, along the lines of direct services, there are many organizations that you can volunteer for, um, or also host donations and drives for survivors. Also look out to your local faith-based organizations um, for a lot of trafficking victims, that's sometimes their first place of solace um, when they are um, in a situation like this. So often a lot of faith-based organizations have sort of things that you can do and help out with in the parish to um, combat trafficking or help survivors. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Shanifa, any other thoughts about where to, where to find help? You've, I know you've been in touch with many organizations. Oh, you're on mute. There you go. Yes, get in touch with an organization, community-based, um, international. Um, get educated as well. Try to get educated on the problem um, a lot. Get educated because there's so much information um, that people need to know. Um, 
panels like this, even just uh, info sheet from any organization. So great. And and your info sheet will be available for anyone at the end of the presentation, along with John's data for people who are interested. Um, we are coming to the end of our time. I want to thank all of our panelists for sharing your expertise, sharing the information that uh, about what your organizations are doing to protect children online. Um, ECPAT USA will continue to work with our global and domestic partners to advocate for policies that protect children, educate and raise awareness and foster best practices to ensure that no child will ever again be exploited. We invite you to visit our website at ecpatusa.org and access the free resources that we have available for youth, their families, the private sector, and policymakers. ECPAT USA is committed to ensuring that every child has the right to grow up free from the threat of sexual exploitation and trafficking. And this concludes our panel. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thanks Bye -bye. very much. Bye. Thank you. Hi. <laughs>